Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming today. We are thrilled, and thank you for finding the time um, during very busy days. I know hospitals are very busy, clinics are very busy. Um, we are gathered today um, in honor and recognition of the World AIDS Day, which is always celebrated December 1st. Um, I don't know if we can say the word celebrated. I think it's probably paying the tribute of the major epidemic that affected our community here in D.C. and affected communities globally. And that's the day when we gather together and we look at different topics each year. Over the years, we have focused on the global epidemic, we focused on the local epidemic, and today we want to dedicate something very important for our community and something that we are going to start up in the coming uh, months with all your support. We're already doing this work across different divisions, but we really want to make at the hospital level a very strong effort. And we are going to focus today on scaling our prep for adolescents and youth in the community and pretty much ask ourselves, can we do it? And before I introduce our panelists, and it will be a form of the panel today, I wanted just to remind ourselves some very important milestones and where our country stands. In February, in March of this year, uh, there was a big announcement by President Trump. It was an announcement on behalf of multiple meetings and stakeholders and decisions made between CDC, NIH, and HRSA. An official national plan to end epidemic in the United States has been announced, in case you guys didn't hear it on the news. The problem in the United States, we have about 1 million people living with HIV, but for the last 10 years, we have had the same number of new infections. They have not gone down. There's been always around 40,000 new cases each year, and despite everything that we hold at our hands, and we have in our tools right now, in prevention tools, we have not gone anywhere with that. Our virus suppression rates are very suboptimal in many, many populations in the country. And that means that even with drugs and excellent services available and multiple support available, we still have a lot of people living with HIV who are not biologically suppressed. They are not benefiting from today's treatment, the health suffers, and the community suffers because the HIV transmission is ongoing. So that national plan is aiming by 2030, to achieve 75% reduction of new infection in five years first and then 90% in the 10 years. So we have 10 years to decrease the new infections in the U.S. by 90%. And it addresses it through several points. It's diagnosing all people with HIV as early as possible, treating people and effectively reaching sustained viral suppression, something that I told you currently is a challenge to us. Preventing HIV transmission by using multiple methods, including PrEP, and that's pre-exposure prophylaxis, and syringe services programs for the people using intravenous drugs, and then respond quickly to any potential outbreaks and need prevention and treatment services. Particularly, it's been done a really great work mapping United States for the areas of the highest impact of epidemic and 48 highest burden counties have been mapped to the United States, majority of them, by the way, in the south of the United States. D.C. Uh, is one of them, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and actually three, uh, three uh, counties in the area here, including Prince George's County, a couple of Maryland counties, and one Virginia county are also on that map. And these are the areas of the highest burden. That's where all the funding by HRSA, NIH, CDC, and all the efforts is going to go in the coming years. And I just wanted to show you briefly, I'm not going to take much time from the panel, but I do want you to render how big HIV services are at Children's. You hear us at different locations, special immunology clinic at Children's, which cares for the majority of patients with HIV, at Children's uh, Burgess program led by Dr. D'Angelo within Adolescent Health Center, and the prep work done throughout multiple other locations, including all adolescent health science department. But this is just to give you a glance of how many people Ryan White funding supports the children and how many prongs of work we do. We do cooking classes and support uh, peer support groups for adolescents. We use Uber uh, cooperative account while among the first national services that Uber patients for peer support. We have extensive mental health services. We have patient navigation model. Our Uber motor has been scaled up on the regional level. And just to give you a breath uh, of how much this program is doing and how much we put on working with adolescents, teenagers, children, and mothers who live with HIV and working with multiple partners, we receive referrals from 21 regional hospitals on the newborn babies uh, exposed to HIV infection. And again, not going in a death, just want you to render how many people in this institution 
are supported by federal funding and are working and in addition do a tremendous amount of research in, in collaboration with multiple partners including George Washington University. I'm very proud to say that we recently went back. We are waiting still for application to be reviewed by NIH as one of the CRS as a part of clinical trials unit led by University of San Diego in collaboration with St. Jude Hospital, Baylor Hospital, uh, Northeastern University in Chicago, Florida University, University of San Diego. So just a few examples to say that in addition to delivering services, we have a pretty robust research pocket. And I'm very proud to say that this last year, in just around the summer months, there was an additional funding released by HOSPA, which is expanded focus on early intervention services. This specific line of funding allows you to use Ryan White funding, not for only infected populations, which we have done for years, but really looking at prevention within our communities. And it is approaching status neutral, so now you can use Ryan White funding independent of HIV positive or negative status. It aimed at yielding innovative culturally appropriate services, improving access to quality of services, client centered services, the whole metropolitan DC area, and improving the responsiveness of care systems and engaging in meeting the needs of focused population. And youth is one of the focused population. I think I did something wrong. Well, let me approve this, right? Okay. Um, can you help me? I have to approve something or disapprove <laughs> something <laughs> or decline something if you kindly tell me. Oh, here it is. Okay. I think I found it, right? Approve? Um, okay. Just close it. Yeah, yeah, just close it. Just close it. Just close it. Okay. I don't want to approve something that <laughs> I don't know. A lot of dollars going somewhere. And so, status neutral approach is maximizing whole person. We do know people take prep well when they are treated as a whole person. We do know with the prep, which is still taking a day to prevent HIV, it, we need to step away from being just doctors. Here's what you do. It needs to be a dialogue. It needs to be patient telling us. I don't want to do it now for next two months, and I will restart myself in three months, and we need to know how to work around it. And so providing the clients with the same level of ongoing individualized services, regardless of the HIV status. And we quickly moved on doing this. We now have community advisory board changing from just positive individuals, including negative individuals, and approaching the whole services from this lens. And I'm hoping I can move this slide further. And I don't know if I can anymore. Whenever I decline, stop me from doing the slides. So let's see. Mm -mm. Let me see if I can. There you go. And just to introduce again, I'm going to wrap up so our panelists have a chance to talk. But this new regional approach is based on something that Mayor uh, Muriel Browser supports very much. It's a five uh, high five uh, model. Find them, identify individuals as high-risk population, teach them, educate them about HIV, STI, U equals U, undetectable, means uninfectable, test them, link them, and keep them. And keep them is probably one of the hardest tasks which we have done for years with our infected populations. Okay, let me try to do one more. And just to say that children did compete for this funding, and we're very proud to tell you we successfully won it. And this is our program, and we will uh, have separate program. We are not going to dedicate time today, but we are, uh, have proposed and we're very well ranked and received funding to create consolidated youth prep center at Children's, which will incorporate multiple divisions. I'm looking, Lisa Tagman has been very supportive, Dr. D'Angelo. Others are even our emergency department, uh, students here in the room, Monica Goyal, multiple partners, a Shine Clinic, immediate prep initiation and ambulatory and ED healthcare settings. Community youth prep initiation support by currently hiring a large body of outreach coordinators who will be able to meet with young people in the community with a special starter app youth friendly package and talk to them and initiate them on prep and school based prep education referrals and support for school nurses, which already cashes on an existing extremely good and well built relationship of our hospital with the local school nursing. Um, uh, so, this is a Four programs on which we just started. The funding just came to children about a month and a half ago, and we are working very uh, actively in advancing this. So today we are very fortunate to have a special panel dedicated to the prep and focusing on the prep for young people. And during this uh, panel, we hope to describe the current approaches to implementing prep in metropolitan DC, analyze barriers and facilitators, uptake among adolescents and youth and discuss how to implement effective preventive strategies, including counseling young people on PrEP and referral in the area. 
And I'm very happy to introduce our panelists. We are thrilled to have one of the leaders regionally in scale and our prep, and nationally, I would say. When you go to HIV conference or prevention conference, the name Whitman Walker comes up probably every five minutes. <laughs> and uh, so I'm really, really thrilled to have here Megan Coleman. She is the Director of Community Research and Family Nurse Practitioner at Whitman Walker. She leads a tremendous amount of grants and uh, equally programmatic implementations of PrEP, specifically looking at the fusion of the PrEP with medical assisted therapy. I believe right now Whitman Walker cares for about 20,000 patients living with HIV and about 2,000 and a half patients on PrEP for different services. And she's also a principal investigator on multiple uh, grants and awards, including the um, uh, AIDS Clinical Trials Network in collaboration with John Hopkins. Truly one of the leaders, and also, may I say, dear friend and great colleague who gave me many times wonderful advice. Next to Megan, we are very, very honored to have to be Faith Mitchell. She's an MPH graduate student at Harvard University, and she's a community health educator who works uh, with the prevention program coordinator at Whitman Walker. Faith is working a lot with the community, linking out and particularly focusing on sexual health of the women and a scaling up of PrEP in women as well. Welcome, Faith. Thank you very much for coming. And next, you have two people from children who many of you have met the come across. We have Nara Lee. She is our social worker manager and case manager now has long standing history of working within HIV program here both at Burgess and SIS and then has worked in Detroit and we're very happy to have her come back a few years ago and leading a lot of our prep work as a case management for prep. And finally, the person who needs to have the least introduction is Kathy Sarah, who many of you know, uh, Kathy is a um, uh, former Baylor lead in, in South Africa in Lesotho in implementing and building the first adolescent HIV program. She's a hospitalist here at Children's, but also a lead of education with all our global health initiative that Children's launched a few years ago. So welcome, um, our panelists. Thank you for spending time today. So. Uh, let me start. Um, let me start by, um, uh, and the way we will run it is very informal. I will round up with first questions that I thought would be relevant for our discussion today. But do feel free to interrupt or raise your hand at any point when you want to make any comment or ask a question. Um, if you are too timid <laughs> and need time to warm up to questions, we'll just go through rounds of our discussion, but still have end uh, at the end time. So let's just play it by ear and see how the audience will respond. So Megan, I will start with you, um, and I would like to ask you first, uh, you have led a lot of prep work. And on the national level, Whitman Moker is highlighted as one of the national leaders. What I'd like to ask you, how does implement prep work? I mean, obviously, we primarily adults, but as well. So could you just share some experience of building up the prep program that's so successful? and running it here in the area of the epidemic. Of course. Do I speak there? You can just talk. All right. So okay. thank you so much for having us. We're really excited to be here. Um, PrEP is my favorite thing in the world to talk about because I am a nurse by training and I, health promotion and prevention are things that are in my blood and give me so much joy. And to be able to share this with all of you is really, really special. So thank you. PrEP scale up for us was, um, Pretty natural. I was brought on in 2012, 2013 to start the PrEP demonstration project, which was an NIH-focused PrEP program. And before that, we really weren't doing much PrEP at all. We had about 20 patients in zero different relationships um, that were on it, and that was about it. Overnight, I would say we had a, a month waiting list for people wanting to get on PrEP. The demand led our programming. Patients asked for it. Patients demanded it. Patients were not able to access it anywhere else. So we had to keep up with it. We rapidly grew and integrated into primary care, so it just became part of what we offered as primary care and was just part of the natural day of a, of a, a primary care clinician. So in a given day, I may be treating someone living with HIV, also may be treating or preventing HIV, as well as preventing gen gender-affirming services, general pap smears, general primary care to patients. Um, as that grew, we had barriers to patients coming in because patients were still demanding, and so we had wait lists. And so we had to think about how to offer PrEP outside of that. We average about 50 to 70 new PrEP patients a month, and these are patients new to primary care, new to care in general. So for me, PrEP is really an engagement into the healthcare system. It's a way to build trust with patients that may have 
not had the most trusting relationships in the past. And so if you treat someone with respect and dignity around their sexual health, I find that, and we find that they're more likely to stay engaged, build healthy relationships with the medical system. So after that, we started having, trying to think of other ways to reach patients because we were getting a certain number of patients and type of patients, but we weren't reaching all the patients we wanted to meet. So in addition to spreading PrEP around the, around the city, around the country, we also started thinking about where patients enter in. We started doing PrEP in our evening STI clinic and doing what we call same-day PrEP, so patients walking out with a prescription and appointment in three weeks with primary care. We started running the PrEP clinic, which they will, can talk about more as the program leader, which is after-hours um, clinic that's run by really trained um, community health professionals following a protocol to reduce barriers with time that patients have to come to the doctor's office. Um, we started bringing PrEP out into the community with a mobile health initiative, and so just really but at the, at the core of it, PrEP was the easiest thing I do as a primary care provider. I write a prescription. I get to see people quarterly. I know patients' families, friends. I get to do vaccinations. I try to diagnose prediabetes and, and get people engaged in care earlier and easier. And so in general, the PrEP program started as a primary care linkage and now has kind of expanded a little bit outside of that um, and really identifying where patients are, meeting them where they are, and then providing them a safe space to transition as needed. You mentioned challenges. Um, I do want to pass on now to Faith. Faith, you work with the community. A couple of questions from me. First, we're hearing the patients came asking for PrEP, right? Mm -hmm. But we're also hearing distrust in the medical system, and this is something that, to me, is still a conceptually completely new relationship with the provider. You do not come because of the need, which is majority of the morbidities. Those people come to the physicians because they need something for something to stay healthy. But this is a preventive intervention where you come because of your sexual health. And it's a completely new paradigm of relationship to me. So what would be very interesting to hear from you is that what is community hearing? What, what is your sense of the community need leads and barriers and challenges and success? Um, yeah, so the community is, there's a lot of people who are aware of PrEP, and then there's still a lot of people who are not aware of PrEP. Uh, so on a given basis, a lot of things that I do include HIV testing. And so I do that both within the health center and I do that outside of the health center in the community. So it's people that aren't necessarily engaged in care. Some of them are engaged in care, some of them aren't. But regardless of where they're at, they have a perception of what PrEP is. Or when I tell them what PrEP is, they have a perception of what it is after that. Um, and so I think a lot of the barrier comes to play in how PrEP has been promoted in the past. It has been promoted to start to be something that's primarily for the men, the men who have sex with men, for the MSM community. And then on top of that, there was a lot of conversations about around risk. And so um, a lot of people are still under the perception that for you to get prescribed PrEP and for you to be on PrEP, you must have some outlandish sexual activity that you're involved in. You have to be having sex with a lot of people. You have to be having sex with random people. You can't just be someone in a monogamous relationship that just wants to protect their sexual health. So I think that one of the key barriers that I find is that people's perception of risk and even other health professionals' perception of risk creates a barrier as to who would be prescribed PrEP and who thinks that PrEP is for them. Uh, so a lot of time I spend talking to people about what your personal risk looks like and even getting away from the word risk and talking about the things that expose you to HIV, having people understand that just in general, having sex expo can expose you to HIV, and so PrEP is just another method that you use to prevent it, to help yourself, as just another normal part of health. I think what um, Megan said with sexual health being an introduction to primary care, what we do as community health workers now is we look at unsiloing sexual health care from your primary care. And so even I talk to my mom, who's a dermatologist, I talk to her about PrEP, and I tell her, like, you should try to integrate this somewhere. She's like, how? I'm like, I don't know. We can work it out. Um, but really helping all types of professionals understand that PrEP is something that they should know about and share and that sexual health is something that we have to destigmatize and really learn how to talk to our, our clients about. A lot of professionals, professionals are still not comfortable even asking their clients or patients about their sexual activity or make assumptions based off of what they know. So they might say, oh, my client's been married for 10 years. 
I don't need to ask them anything about about sex. I don't even need to run an HIV test at this point. And so that's where you get to the people where you could have prevented HIV for them, but it just didn't come to mind. I read a study um, where there were um, they 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 talked to HIV positive people and they asked them about their risk prior to becoming HIV positive. So did you know that you were at risk before this happened? A large majority of those people actually had had sex with a monogamous person at least four times before their diagnosis. And so they were in monogamous relationships. They had no, none of them said that they perceived themselves to be at risk at all. They had no thoughts that their partner may have other partners or any other type of approximation to risk. Uh, and so I think it's just important that at this point in time, we educate everybody about PrEP regardless of where they're at with their sexual health, with their relationship status, because that's probably the biggest barrier. Aside from some things, I, medical mistrust, I could go into that for quite a while, but um, I think that that perception of risk is something that really stops people from their own self-referrals and as well as providers missing some people that could really be candidates for PrEP. Thank you, Faith. I couldn't do that anymore. Uh, we go and talk with the long wisdom and service web session and how she's going to with uh, renal transplant and which are diagnosed for with HIV. And I do want to care on what you said for, um, when we talk with her about diagnosis, she's very open and everything. But at the end, when I asked her how she feels, her response was, I'm still in shock. I haven't done anything of the risky behavior. And, and that's, that's just so much links to what they did. Right. And, we went on a very good talk about saying we live in a community, we live in a community, we work in a community that is HIV epidemic by all the global standards, where 1.9% of the population is still living with HIV. You don't need to be doing anything, usually you need just to be living your life, and that's what our conversation was. But well, with the funding that we've got from Hertz and DOH, we're very proud to be leaders in the PrEP uh, scale up as children. Originally, and I want to skip for a moment now and go to Kathy, who did a lot of prep work with us and has gone already on the um, discussions and talks with the community providers. Kathy, you know from our previous work and the survey we have done that there is that barrier, both not only with the uh, community, but I think with the community of providers as well. Pediatricians notoriously um, are famous for not touching sexuality. Um, issues, uh, it, it's kind of painful to see the child becoming, <laughs> in a way, somebody adult, and I do know that the pediatric community is frequently um, blamed for not being too active and too proactive, except obviously for adolescent core of the providers who are very keen at that. Could you talk on your end with our first steps in implementing this program and your encounters of your perspectives where the provider community and pediatric provider community stands in the way? Sure. So, um, Again, it's fantastic that we have this funding in order to increase awareness of PrEP. It's definitely, um, everybody's here. Obviously, the aware of PrEP is here. Um, but uh, definitely, in terms of providers at large in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia community, they are not aware of PrEP, especially for our population. Right? So PrEP was just approved by the FDA in 2012. It was approved for kids less than 18 and less than and over 35 kilos in 2018. That was just a year ago, right? And so a lot of the actually referrals that I've gotten, especially in immunology, for kids to go on PrEP were pediatricians from the community who heard about it through their residents. The residents were in clinic, and they're the ones that said, hey, why don't we talk about PrEP? Oh, we can refer over to children to discuss PrEP. A lot of our uh, local Goldberg clinics, uh, CHC, um, uh, Comp, uh, ADMO, uh, York, and Anacostic, they are now definitely much more comfortable with it. We've um, spoken with them, and with this grant funding can increase our support in terms of getting a PrEP integrated, like you were saying, into the primary care, where it becomes routine. I think one of the huge um, opportunities at UMC, at UMC, you know, we implemented a universal HIV testing in, in 2010, so people are used to HIV, they're used to being tested for HIV. Um, on top of that, we built um, our STI um, program, uh, where we do universal screening for chlamydia and gonorrhea, and our uh, percent positivity rate for STIs at UMC, basically testing all kids who come in, regardless if they're coming for a cold, a rash, um, uh, URI symptoms over 13, is somewhere between 12 to 20 percent. 
So kids are having unprotected sex, and that's another place where our ED doc can um, educate about PrEP or talk about PrEP. So they have all these different touch points because we know that you need probably at least 15 touch points before you say, huh, PrEP, maybe that's for me. And I, as I've been going around on the circuit, essentially talking to a lot of our providers here at Children's, I think um, folks know HIV is here, but they don't quite understand the, um, the uh, epidemic. When I think in 2016, numbers came out where the risk, the lifetime risk of getting HIV being a resident in D.C. is 1 in 13. That is incredible that your chance of getting HIV if you live in D.C. is 1 in 13. And clearly, again, in terms of disparities, we know with this mapping and all this new molecular surveillance uh, ability that we could target. We could target where we need to put all of our resources and have that prep match where need is. We're getting new um, infections, and that's where we put our resources for, for prep. And I think in terms of providing, unfortunately, I have a story as well, in terms of a kiddo who I just got referred to, um, was being seen as Tom, and um, they had been MSM, or uh, MSM, but identified as bi. They'd been talking to the family about PrEP for many months. They had referred to the reproductive health clinic that's at Tom. He had been seen there, and they quite hadn't gotten to the point of doing the prescription. Um, where really, when I talked to the provider, because the provider was my wife, <laughs> who was with me in Africa, so she knows HIV, she knows talking about PrEP. Um, the mother was the one that was, the kid was very interested, but the mother still wasn't quite sold on the idea. And so this kid just tested positive. So that's a big fail for us. So he even had all these things in place, yet that kid still got in fact, was engaged in care, was accessing care, had PrEP discussions, yet didn't quite get on PrEP in time. A lot, I think, is because of that perception of risk. Uh, in the United States, one in two MSM, black MSM, will get HIV. That is a scary number. And so that's where, again, we, a lot of, um, uh, again, will not touch the, uh, the mistrust of the <laughs> medical community because, again, just on Monday we had a parent who was said, well, you know, Magic Johnson, he's cured of HIV, mm -hmm. right? Where, again, we're pushing these drugs to get to make money for ourselves because we're going to make money off of PrEP. So I think there's still a lot of um, work to be done in terms of providers learning, um, being able to be aware, accept, and then engage, and then get to that next step of actually. Well, that's so international, sort of a segue for me to come tomorrow because I think through the funding and the program that I highlighted to what we are looking at is creating the easy access and easy follow-up for PrEP. And I think the challenge for many primary care or any outreach startup, if you start somebody on the PrEP, what is the goal? When do they decide to stop it? How do you bring them back? Um, how do you create this relationship that is ongoing? And I think what we're trying to build here at Children's is quite unique as adolescent focus support system that will work with you no matter what, and no matter which modality will keep support you, even if you get off the field, we'll still meet you in the community and talk to you about prevention. And now I really need a lot of interaction with our young people on, on PrEP, so I wanted her to share some of the perspectives. We already heard several examples from Faith and Kathy. Um, would you share some of the barriers to PrEP for sessions who you are able to connect and the PrEP is on the agenda? Uh, what do you hear? What do you hear as a very or possibly no very facilitator from the young people? Um, okay, so the temporary prep hotline is actually my direct number. Uh, also <laughs> <laughs> on the children's website. Yeah, working on this. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right now it's not a number. Yeah, so I get calls from all over. Um, I get calls from Alabama too. Um, but also, I'm, it's my number is also the main number on the children's website for HIV services, too. So all the intakes, all questions regarding HIV basically come to my main line. Um, so I think one of the biggest things that I've been uh, noticing a trend is um, I'll get calls from kids that have um, insurance through their parents, right? And if it's private insurance, 
uh, if the parents want to look at the claim, they can see that they come to our clinic and they can see what they came in for. And one, they don't want them to know that they're sex reactive. Two, they're like, well, I don't want them to know that I'm even thinking about it because I don't want my parents to think that I'm just like sleeping around. Um, and uh, another thing is, a uh, biggest thing that I've been getting a lot from the African American female heterosexual community is the fact that they feel like they're not at risk. You know, I tell them all the numbers, I tell them about the statistics, uh, but for them, they're like, well, you know what, I'll just, I'll just use condoms 100% of the time. And I always do this thing when I'm doing my intake and talking to them is, okay, um, when you, um, prior to hearing about PrEP, like, what was your condom use, right? Like, and usually they'll say about 70%. And I'm like, okay, well, now that you know more about it, like, what, what do you feel like is your condom use going to be? And they're like, yeah, 100%. And I'm like, but really, you know, is it, you know, when I really get to talking to them, they're like, well, okay, probably about 85, 90%. So um, I think the biggest thing um, as far as, like, you know, even with kids that are engaged in care and even with kids that we're trying to, uh, that are already in care, um, I think the, the biggest thing for me, um, uh, an example was I had a call from a, um, a patient, but not a patient yet, but she called and said, hey, I just want to get HIV testing. And I said, okay, well, so, like, these, uh, where are you living? I tried to give her uh, locations that she could go for free in the Northwest area. It was around, like, 4.55 p.m. on a Friday night, right? Um, and she had said she had called all these places, and they said they, they needed, she needed an appointment. So I told her, you know what? Have you come to Children's before? So why don't you come um, and come to the ED, tell them that you are here for HIV test. And just out of curiosity, I was like, hey, like, what prompted you to, like, want to get an HIV test? And she said that there was um, something going on on Twitter about uh, someone being inf uh, infected and infecting other people. And then she was hearing things about uh, this thing called PrEP and HIV testing. And so she started kind of, she said it was about four or five times that she heard about it. And she thought, you know what, maybe I should get tested. And when she was telling me this, she just literally burst it into tears. And to have an HIV test for the first time is a very scary thing for anyone, right? And so I ended up giving her my personal cell phone number and told her, you know what, if you come to the ED, and they give you a hard time because you're, you're 18, 19, and you're coming to the children's hospital, call me, I'll come right away, and I'll help you out. And she ended up texting me at 7 p.m. saying, hey, I came, I got tested, it was negative. And so that was my in um, with a bunch of emojis and trying to kind of engage, <laughs> going, engaging with her and saying, hey, so there's this thing called PrEP, and, you know, I, I, I've been trying to get in, getting her to come to our um, youth advisory board for our status neutral community um, advisory board to really get her opinion. But I think that having that one-on-one, -on -one, going that extra mile for patients, knowing that you are there for them makes a huge difference in really getting them to know that you actually care and you're willing to be there for them, even if they were to go off of it. I'll go back now to uh, make it bothers me, and I think a lot about it, that I kept telling the HIV Global Committee that there are a lot of debates right now. The recent mandate from first on all the funding for HIV prevention was immediate initiation of PrEP on the map. I don't think we even have a good definition of what immediate means. Does it mean within two hours? You still need to test the person and have the results back that they're negative. I can tell the global community, including international aid societies, there are a lot of debates right now. What do we call it? Is it seven days? Is it 48 hours? Is it 72 hours? You guys have done immediate initiation of prep. Could I hear from you how it works? What, what are your thoughts? Are you in favor? I mean, I, I, I can tell I, I clearly welcome the motion, but I still think a lot of unanswered questions. There. So since you are doing the same day prep, could you share with us? We haven't done it yet that much, I think. We've done it on some occasions, but. Absolutely. I can go through how, as a provider, we do it, and then maybe, Faith, you can kind of talk about, like, how if that's changed the messaging in the community. Mm -hmm. um, we initially started, just like when you start anything, a little bit nervous, a little bit scared, drawing blood, making, calling patients, calling in a prescription after the blood work was back, having a rapid HIV test and a fourth gen, having all, everything at our fingertips and calling a patient in and then we'd have prescriptions never picked up. So one thing about 
prevention or HIV prevention is this immediacy need, is that someone is showing up with this idea that they are, something is at risk. They're getting an HIV test. They're coming in for PrEP. They're open to it at that moment. And so even the sheer negative HIV test result and walking out that door can lower their risk perception, and they may never pick up the prescription, and they never start it until they have another thing that makes them think, I should get an HIV test. And that may be one too long. And I think one of the things we've heard is how much of an impact that one person, how much work you may have to do for that one person to start PrEP, but how important it is to prevent that person from seroconverting. So for us and for me, I was like, well, what's the biggest risk? The biggest risk is the idea of AR, is, um, ARV resistance. If someone is, HIV, is living with HIV at that moment and they walk out and they get 30 days of, of Truvada at that time, What's my risk? And then I, we did the calculations in our head, how many we actually have the, in acute seroconversion, how to do a really good acute seroconversion evaluation. And my risk was really small. And so I prescribe people 30, we now prescribe everyone that comes in 30 for, in primary care, 30 days of, of prescription off the bat. And then we would love to be able to give people medication as like little tubes of meds as they walk out. Our health system is not set up that way necessarily. So that's what we do in our evening clinic is we're able to give patients um, seven days of meds, or we can give them a prescription that they can fill right then, and, and we have prep navigation services to help navigate any insurance barriers or other things we do. What we found was that our one-month visit and or quarterly visit follow-up jumped tremendously. So patients were able to pick up their medication, because I can go to the pharmacy and see who picks up their meds, because um, I'm, like, behind the scenes that stocky. Um, and then I also know that they come back. And then what, what research has shown is if they start meds, and get through that first four weeks and navigate through any side effects, any issues, figure out how to navigate taking a pill every day if they're not used to it and have it part of their lives, they'll stay on it. And they may, need, they'll, they may come off it at one point because life changes, things change, everything, and, and this is not necessarily meant to be permanent for everybody. But if you get someone at that moment and capture them when they're feeling vulnerable or it, that this will make an impact in their lives, you're reaching them at a time where they're, you're establishing that trust and you're meeting them where they are. And they're coming to you asking for something and you're giving them something to walk away with. Yeah, I think our providers have done a really good job with speaking to clients about different ways to adhere to the medication and speaking them through their side effects that they may have um, when they first start PrEP. I think that giving it to them, giving them that prescription when they walk away has made a tremendous difference. And then on top of that, what we have with our prep clinic, so we really realize that our medical system is, you know, at capacity and providers are very stretched. You know, there's all these expectations. You can't necessarily give the one-on-one -on -one that would be required. It does take a lot of time to really assess everything and get a patient to really start prep and stay on prep, right? So what we have with our prep clinic, um, I won't go through all the details, but we do offer for follow-ups. So you have to do quarterly follow-up visits. So what we do have with that is we have evening hours um, up until 7 p.m. where patients can come in and they can do their follow-up with one of what we call our PrEP specialist, who is just a highly trained health educator that can do phlebotomy, that knows how to um, assess patients, does a questionnaire about their hearing, et cetera. But the main thing I think that has been helpful with the PrEP clinic is that we have the capacity to follow up with clients. And so when we have someone who starts PrEP or if there's anybody who's kind of um, – inconsistent with their PrEP follow-up, the providers are able to refer them to the PrEP clinic and the additional service that we offer are follow-up phone calls. And so those phone calls have made a difference yeah, as well. Yeah, uh, yeah kind, of, kind of sort of like that, but we, all, we only call them about, the, about that, so we can't really help with too much else. But we do call them, we ask them when they start PrEP, how is your first week gone? So how much have you taken the medication? Are you having any side effects? And what we, what we found was we caught additionally people who weren't able to, to pick up their prescription. Mm -hmm. So for whatever the reason was, insurance, whatever mm -hmm. barriers, we were able to catch that within the first seven days. And so then we were able to do all of our prep navigation for them and remind them when it's time for their next visit. So we call them whenever it's time to schedule their quarterly visit. We call them a lot of times. We had to scale back. So <laughs> uh, we call them a good, like, four times, like, send them an email, send them a text, all of that stuff. And they're like, oh, shoot, I, I did get your fourth uh, voicemail, <laughs> and uh, I think I'm going to come in now. So um, it has been very helpful. Not everybody has the capacity, but I think, honestly, that follow-up aspect is super important when it comes to PrEP because a lot of people are just like, it's for prevention. I don't have anything, so, like, it's not that big of a deal if I don't take it. Um, and so 
that encouragement, like getting them on the phone and being like, how's it going? And, you know, catching that, they're like, eh, I don't really think I need it. Well, let's talk about that real quick. Let's have a little conversation. And um, that really, really helps them. They feel very well taken care of. That's very useful. I appreciate our program. Uh, about the fact that we now have under this new planning which I've learned we are hiring a full-time case manager just for PrEP and full-time provider just for PrEP. And the tracking system is the most important. Because mm -hmm. for us, I think, for the rest of the challenge is the conduct information, mm -hmm. which changes daily. I don't know what, I think I'm going to eat this up once <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, changing, but really to be able to reach and pull up on insurance. I don't think that our primary care settings have capacity that level of case management, and that's why I'm using this word, maybe not case managers, but case management model, uh, which I believe we are all hearing mm -hmm. from you, that's what the prep sessions need. Mm -hmm. uh, even if they are on and in, on and off therapy, they need to maintain this relationship with uh, people, with people who will mm -hmm. remind caring for their prevention approach. We are approaching toward the end of the hour. I don't think we have much audience input. So what I'd like to do is stop with going around the table, uh, give the opportunity Thanks, for please. people. Yes, ask questions or make comments, please. And who will help us with, you will help us. Thank you so much with microphone. So let us go around. What we will do is the total closing. I will ask each of the panelists give one or two minutes just closing remarks. But for now, let's please open up for discussion questions. So, you know, obviously, first of all, thanks to the panel. It's really very helpful. Um, this is a former junior high school teacher in the teaching county. Um, it seems to me that families uh, in D.C. and I mean, even our um, residents here often don't know the nature of the epidemic and the area of shock and the learning of it. Is there any outreach to TTA and school groups so that it could be very in a very simple way to say if half of all NSM young people are going to end up with HIV and then you see this is the epidemic and have the same behavior in some parts of North Virginia and not get in any trouble, but you live in a certain neighborhood. And I think that message is now here for families and that idea of loving the care. Uh, it can be reframed, and the other way to be reframed is what I think with a faith community, particularly for our African American families. And I wonder if there can be um, outreach in all of those areas. So, this very simple message that you send, which I never hear on the TV or the radio, gets out there. Thank you, Maureen. I will let Kathy answer, but before I move on, I want to acknowledge here in your own, she's a new pregnancy, starting with us at the end of the month. And her husband, Mayor Dave, Mayor Cher, is, is uh, working with you. So we are really looking for her to do the advice and bridging out to work in the community. And on the school end, all that Catholic comments, we're already doing a lot of work with schools with support of Lisa and very uh, reaching out and leveraging our existing school programs. But Catholic, they want to give some. Sure, and I want to recognize Gabriella. Who's Gabriella? <laughs> yeah. Gabriella is, I guess, our prep yeah. head coordinator, she's coordinator, and she yeah. basically is stocking my calendar and filling it up <laughs> with all of these speaking events. And Nara is in terms of going out to the schools, the three high schools that we're at, Coolidge, Baloo, and Bar, as well as using the leveraging the fact that Children's National has Children's National nurses at 100 and, 180 nurses at schools within the district and in Montgomery County and using that as well as we've uh, definitely made connections with uh, the DC Aussie, yes. whatever that stands for, <laughs> but getting ourselves prepped into the curriculum, especially down at the middle school level because this is relatively new and so they haven't done their curriculum since 2016, so now being able to get it into there. And I think also in terms of faith-based communities, that's uh, faith based um, uh, sites is really important because, again, like the example that I talked about, it's really convincing a lot of parents as well is that we need them to be our allies in protecting our kids and saying we have another tool. Again, there are lots of competing priorities in terms of flu vaccine, HPV. Oh, yeah, and here's now PrEP that we also want you to uh, talk to the kids about. Um, but I think uh, the other uh, strategy we're using is we're hiring community health workers 
And so we'll have people from the community, of the community, in the community, helping us strategize and really target places that we need to be. Um, for example, I, we spoke at DYRS. Um, just last week, and we're going to do, yeah, uh, yeah. Youth, youth and rehabilitation, yeah. youth and rehabilitation yeah. services. We're going to be speaking to those kids on Friday, and I'm really uh, in community, essentially starting from where they are. Like you said, there's not a lot of knowledge necessarily. It doesn't hit the news like it did back in the 80s, 90s. Most of our kids don't know who Magic Johnson is. And I wish, I hope Little Nas comes out and he, uh, maybe we could use him as a spokesperson for prep. That would be phenomenal. Um, and in terms of uh, strategies that we've put into this proposal, again, Gabriella has certainly been amazing at really reaching out and going to the just uh, as we move around here and see in ways we can um, adjust as we pass on. Um, just want to recognize also Gabriella's work with our uh, partners in the community. We're also pairing up with several mobile systems uh, that are particularly targeting young people. So we've been going out on weekends in the very cold weather, <laughs> the cold team, um, uh, and trying to work with them as well. Uh, somebody got a microphone. Okay. I have a question for you. Fantastic. Natalie, guys, congratulations on the Dr. Rockney. Let's see. Quick uh, question. It's really for some. You know, it strikes me that in D.C. alone, the average population is actually eligible. Just look at that one. Population. So, can you just briefly on the cost implications of sort of crap for everyone, crap for all? What does that look like? And uh, do you have to deal with and other um, resources? And don't get me wrong, I'm a huge proponent, but I think cost always has to be set. Are you interested in really is that um, alternative ways of delivering uh, a great story for COVID vaccines? Specifically, I'm on the birth control. They were taken for a vaccine and um, And then depo uh, uh, preparations to be available. Are depo preparations to crap on the vaccine? So let me start with the second part now, part of the cost part to make it because it sounds tremendous a lot of our thinking seems very much very question goes to very quickly, very relevant, well, cost does matter. Um, I can tell on the global end where I do a lot of work in Africa, South Africa, the Minister of Health currently is considering universal legislation to everybody in GPC. So that's the dark of cost efficiency modeling, but I'll let Megan answer it. On your question on the extended release prep, yes, they're actually already opposed to phase three trials in adults. Combination of carbotegra and rotiverin is that an injection of one milliliter given to each arm once every two months. Now, there are also fantastic work going on done right now about TAP implants, which is one of the major agents looking at biodegradable implants. Uh, they work around the broad neutralizing antibodies, particularly current on the young and of the mother to child transmission, but also potentially for the adult prep as well. We have tried uh, more complex prep measures like vaginal ring and adherence in the same of this below, and the efficacy therefore is lower, the concentration is low. So we do know it needs to be easy, and everybody is looking at the model of the contraceptives. I can tell you one thing that was striking, I just gave a talk at the European conference on HIV, specifically looking at the options for prep, and one of the things that's striking is that in the um, uh, home of contraception world, nothing that we call long acting in HIV three month injections are not considered long acting. Only five years or so forth is considered long acting. So we do have to take it into account because in HIV world right now, every two month injection is considered long acting. And I think as we advance this formulation, we will probably have to also change what we call long acting and look into something with a bigger interval. Right now, there's been a couple of studies in South Africa, one from Baltimore, only site in the U.S., looking at the willingness of young people to go on injections. And so far, the signal is good and mm -hmm. strong, stronger in females than in males. So we will have to tackle that as well, because I think the acceptance of injections might be different and might be driven also by gender and age and the caregiver involvement. So we are in that direction, but still not there with young people fully. 
is going on that right now for Jersey to keep on the North population, but there is one starting a recruitment very soon. And we, if we get successful to going in back network, we are hoping to come back. There's already two protocols online to do injection for prevention. Or on, on the yeah, cost. on the cost. Um, so I, just to piggyback on that, I, I joke about how like prep of 2012 is not the prep of 2019. The prep of 2019 is not the prep of 2025. There are a lot of things on the horizon. There's a lot of things open and there's a lot. And then even from that building on that, it's, it's pretty exciting and that'll be a great day. Um, I'm giving a preview to the CROI presentation we're going to be giving on costs um, with the CDC. So we did an evaluation of costs um, and you can look at it from three different directions. The cost of the medication, the cost of the services, and then the cost on the patient themselves. The patients have to go to the doctor, they have to go quarterly and take off time. And so figuring out a way to bring PrEP to them and lower that barrier is really important from a systems point of view. When you're talking about the cost of the medication, we work in DC, which is amazing because you have 98% insurance coverage or eligibility. For those that are under, under 24 and on their parents' insurance, the DC PrEP DAP program, the drug assistance program, will cover the cost of the medication for them, so the patients don't have to go, have their meds go through their parents' insurance, but that has to have, be navigated. Truvada or Descovy are covered for all patients on insurance in the, in the DC area, and so that's really helpful. And then from in DC with the, and in the United States in general, because the Preventive Health Task Force just gave it a grade A recommendation, by 2022, it should be covered as part of preventative health care. They haven't worked out how that happens yet. The other thing that just happened yesterday was that the Health and Human Services and AZAR just announced the PrEP program for drug dispensation. So 20, 251 million, I think 100 million PrEP pills will be delivered through this program. But what it is is regardless, if you don't have insurance or don't have medication coverage, regardless of your income, you will be eligible to access PrEP through this program. And it's this, it's the same as we've done with um, through Gilead, the, patient, the company that makes Truvada and Descovy. Um, so it's, it's, we've done it about for the last two weeks and it's been pretty easy to navigate. So prep patients will be eligible to access PrEP free of charge, regardless of their ability, their income. Um, and that is over 18 for this program. But if, you're, if you have any questions or any needs for PrEP coverage, you're welcome to give us a call and we'll help navigate. And I'm sure you have services here, but it cost shouldn't be an issue to the patient. I'm coming to them, I'll pick up just two more questions. There has. The number needs to treat is difficult. So when you look, so in order to do true cost effective analysis, you need that NNT. So we have NNTs from larger trials, which can be 1 in 13, looking at specific populations. So to prevent HIV infection, you need to treat 13 patients to prevent one infection. Yeah. Um, and so when you look at it from that, cost, PrEP is very cost effective when done in high impact areas. So certain wards of DC with prevalence rates of over four to 5%. Um, if you look at it from a more systems based or more and more detached, it gets less and less cost effective from that point of view. Um, the CDC re released one recently and found that it was cost effective to, for when looking up to end number to treat to one to 23 and even one to 35. Um, but then it starts to get a little questionable. Oh, the number to prevent cardiovascular disease. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's much more cost effective than to prevent heart attack or stroke with lipid lowering medication. Well, the children's senior talk about Is 
fired. He's going to have to tell more. Learn more about these other um, discriminations and or more the decisions. Prescribed by them following other ways. Yes, absolutely. We will educate anybody who wants to educate will come. Not only will educate, we will coordinate the care for your patients. That thing is the barrier, but if we offer them, we invite them to our cooking classes, if they need other peers who are also on prep, uh, there might be a change of attitude over time. You, as you heard from Faith, Megan, and Naren, we are winning them. These are the usual, it's a, it takes time to, to win their trust and win their desire to work with us. So absolutely, and actually for anyone, yes, absolutely, but anyone who wants any education on PrEP or on children's or our affiliates, then would please steer them our direction. Uh, we probably should create the PrEP email. <laughs> Just the PrEP, we probably will work with our IT, so you don't have to remember individual names, but they, Gabriella, that would be an action step to do. So let us introduce them, we'll introduce it wide wide, so if people have any interest in any discussion around PrEP or PrEP referral, we will have a centralized prep, something starting with prep into a recognizable email where you can shoot it, and we will immediately liaise with you. And we're also very much willing through the funding we have. We not only have funding for the staff, we also have funding for direct patient support, like transportation, meals, etc. We are very much willing to support anybody and maybe facilitate care. I can tell an example that I started today with the young lady with the renal transplant, actually we are providing more support to her <laughs> in terms of attending appointments that her current services can be. So we're definitely going to combine and not to add burden more to her in regards of her current care. We are at the end, I want to give the panelists this chance to do closing remarks starting with Megan, but before I move on, I really want to thank Whitman Walker team for coming, sharing an absolutely invaluable experience. <laughs> We hope to collaborate more in the future because on the pediatric adolescent so thank you so really. Make our schedule even same. We usually see each other only at the meetings once a year sure. or just the coffee, so we can to schedule a dinner together. We should change it. Sure. Okay, so uh, Megan, Faith, Nara, Kathy, some closing remarks short from each one of you. Um, I guess going with your uh, comment, um, I'm actually maybe not with the providers, but I'm trying to integrate into the social workers in the entire hospital. So uh, the majority of the social workers in the hospital is under family services. And so every year, uh, for the last two years, I've been doing um, TU training on HIV, and uh, this coming December 19th, I'm going to be doing one for the social workers talking about our transition program and then also about our press. So utilizing and giving education to the social workers, because these are the social workers in nephrology or cardiology or um, heart and uh, kidney, where like they are having interactions with the family. So if I'm able to kind of instill the information and the um, knowledge onto them, maybe that way we can bridge it. So. Yeah. And I think one of the most important things on reflection about building a prep program is one, it's the easiest thing I do in primary care, it's a nice break, I get to talk to people, I get to connect with them, it's amazing. But also the thing that I, I don't think I touched on enough, and this builds from that, one of the first things we did was train every single person from the front desk mm -hmm. to phlebotomy, to, it does not matter, everyone needs to know about this HIV prevention method, because often it's that conversation, the one-off that someone's getting their blood drawn and having that really emotional experience for some people is where it's gonna make that impact. It's not necessarily coming from me, for some providers, for some patients, it is me telling them. For other patients, it's the MA, it's the nurse, it's the front desk, it's the person that's helping them with their insurance. Everyone should know about it and everyone should be able to at least counsel someone for where to get it. And that was the, the biggest impact, I think, for us. <laughs> we'll think about the ways to do it. Thank you. Yeah, well, I was going to pretty much echo um, what Megan said. I think that we're still at a point, you know, uh, seven years later where awareness is still low. Mm -hmm. So I think the main thing is, is awareness. And I know that we slid past medical mistrust, um, <laughs> but honestly, I really do think that that's what we've been doing all of this time. Um, I think that 
addressing medical mistrust head on is the only way that we're going to be able to engage people in care. And that goes from a provider saying it straight up to their patient that I know that you have this medical mistrust and identifying with that. Um, and even goes to I've talked to Gilead and said you all need to address mm -hmm. the mistrust that you have created yourself um, mm -hmm. within this system. And so I really think that it's something that we all should take seriously as health professionals. As you might not see it, you may not hear it, but I promise you, I hear it every day. And especially when I'm with my 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 community, when I'm with Black people, and I'm in Southeast or I'm anywhere Northwest, it doesn't matter. I tell them about prep and. I would probably say over 80% of the time, something about medical mistrust comes up. Whether they knew about PrEP before and they had a perception or once I tell them what PrEP is, immediately they have something to say about, oh, that's just a pharmaceutical company. Oh, they have a cure. Mm -hmm. Oh, et cetera, et cetera. It's still very prevalent. And so I think that I would definitely implore you all to take that seriously and to address it head on with everybody, with your colleagues especially, and with your patient, talk to them about the mistrust they may have because that is where you'll be able to get that interaction with them that will break down the barrier of them not wanting to talk to you about what's really going on with them, and then you can prevent a lot more things. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess for me, um, I'm only one person, but every Uber pool, every Lyft pool I ever go on uh, for the last two years, I've been doing HIV 101 in the short ride. Uh, if, if someone's in the car, I get picked up at children. They're like, oh, what do you do for a living? That's like a quintessential DC like <laughs> question, right? Uh, and then I tell them I do uh, P HIV pediatric work, and then they start asking me questions. And so in that small amount of time, I become that one of 12 touch points to tell them about the statistics. And I guess that's just my own contribution to like trying to I guess, put awareness. Yeah, yeah. No, I do not have a commitment, but yeah. I'm going to make a bold statement. We can end the HIV epidemic. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. We have the medicine. We have the technology. My job is actually the easy part. Team, you guys stand up. These are our social workers, our nutritionists, our psychologists. <laughs> It's crossing the silos within our own institution, crossing the silos between community and schools and healthcare facilities and emergency rooms uh, and churches and um, crossing those silos and giving uh, the right messaging and the right marketing in order to increase that awareness, get that engagement, and then get that retention, but we can end it, and I'm hoping to do it before I retire. So that's my goal. <laughs> so Catherine stole from me the team record. So that's, that was the big with double mind, right? But just to I do want to. Here today, uh, Larry started it, and it's going on, and, and we are really able to carry out. The goal is to have children really leave adolescents trapped in the area. With recognition of wonderful partners, and I know with Milwaukee, you also do young people and press, but we have such a wealth of adolescent expertise and knowledge, and, and the experience of working with caregivers, which is very challenging because of the youth. This is a time of this fragile transition to independence in many aspects. So I would say that Children's is very committed to lead this effort. It's a novel area for us, um, but on behalf of everybody who supported us here, we hope with support of partners like you with your wisdom and advice, we can really become a center that will help coordinate and advance prep in the community, especially in the young people, and get away from the ratios of one and two uh, that we heard from Maureen and Kathy, or one and 13 at least making the first step within our community and hopefully advance this global again. Again, let us remember all this. I want to finish with something that I do. I'm in the Mayor's DC Council, City Mayor's Council for um, HIV and Health in the area. We always start every meeting we have with um, uh, commemorating those who we lost to the epidemic and those who will acquire epidemic this year, despite all our prevention efforts. So before we close, I'd like to ask everybody, take a moment of silence, recognition of world, they, they think of those who we couldn't reach.
on the positive note, let's make sure that we don't have to absorb this many years from us, get the dead retirement of us. We are going to celebrate more successes and we will remember. So.